uh, where Coach Rana is uh, an assistant coach right now with the Sacramento Kings and has been for the last number of seasons. Um, he came to them from the University of Ryerson, Ryerson University, uh, prior to that, and had a long uh, and is very involved with the Canadian national team, including a historic win back in 2017, where he led Canada to uh, its first gold medal with the uh, junior men's program, uh, which was uh, by far probably that would be, I'd rank in the top five of all, uh, maybe even higher of, of basketball achievements in our history of our sport uh, in, in the 125 plus years as a, as a massive uh, jump forward for our sport. And Coach Rana was uh, the architect, continues to be a, a, a super uh, coach on the Canadian scene and continues to uh, grow and get more involved at the uh, NBA and national international level. So uh, you're here to hear uh, Coach Rana talk, not myself. So we're gonna do a very similar format where some questions we can uh, load up into the Q&A uh, uh, as, uh, as the time goes and, and Coach Rana will uh, dig into as many of them as he can. So he's gonna be speaking about building an offensive system. You can review more about his bio on our website. Appreciate all the kind words and I always look forward to these uh, opportunities. Uh, obviously a little different because I'm having to learn how to navigate the world of technology in a, in a different way as far as communication is concerned. Always a little bit, a bit uh, smoother for me on court. So uh, excuse me if I stumble a little bit and uh, also please, uh, I, I want this to be as interactive as possible. And uh, so please like, you know, ask questions. Uh, Adam, if you can help me through that process that would be great and uh you know excited excited to be uh, continuing to share with the uh, canadian basketball coaches um and this clinic has obviously been pretty special part of our landscape for a number of years so my first time uh, being part of the super clinic and and super excited so i'll just get going and uh hopefully if, you know if, if i if i end short there's lots of questions and we can we can dig into them as well so um so I just want to start by, you know, I asked a question of Adam before I got on is kind of what are the level of the coaches that that have been involved, uh, you know, that are involved in this uh, session today. And a lot of high school coaches, some university coaches, a lot of club coaches. So I just want to talk about my journey a little bit on offense, because typically, you know, I, I share a lot about my journey in coaching. But uh, I thought that this one would be a kind of an interesting way to frame how my growth and learning has has happened over the past really 25 years now. So, uh, you know, I started as the uh, junior boys basketball coach at CW Jeffries High School in um, in Toronto. Uh, in uh, at that point in time, it was the North York Board of Education, and uh, I was a volunteer coach. I was a teacher, but I was a volunteer coach and kind of handed this team without really any opportunity to prepare. Uh, so the first thing I did was went to the school library and started looking for books. And I played high school ball and I don't really remember what we did in high school from an offensive perspective. Um, so really this was just kind of a journey of discovery for me right from day one. And I picked up a, a book from Bob Cousy, Fundamentals of Basketball, and picked out a, a stack offense. It was a low stack offense and started playing around with that stack offense. And that became you know, the first offense that I implemented uh, with one of my teams. And it was the only offense for the most part that we ran. We ran a stack set and we ran a high low against zone. And I don't even remember now so long ago. I don't remember if we did anything else other than use that, that formation to try and, and play. And we had a lot of success. We actually won a North York championship in my first year. And um, the journey began, you know, the journey of growth and learning uh, began. And um, my next stop uh, after I was at uh, CW Jeffries for six seasons, uh, was at Eastern Commerce High School in Toronto. I spent nine years there and we had tremendous amount of success. But one of the things that we had was uh, we didn't have a lot of size. You know, we played small. And uh, it's, it's funny enough, you know, you'll see uh, you know, lots of tendencies in the NBA now of playing small ball and spreading the floor in a lot of different ways. At that point in time, for the most part, you know, we had four guards on the floor that were between, you know, five, ten and six one maybe and some guys like Kingsley Costain who played for me a, a pretty interesting and, and prominent name in Toronto basketball back in that time was I think five eight ended up going to Pepperdine on a scholarship um, 
so we were we were small, but we were able to dominate the province uh, in a lot of different ways because we decided to play five out. And I learned about five out again uh, at uh, Olympia Sports Camp, which is just kind of north of the city. We'd go up there for a week, spend a week at Olympia. It was you know teach the game, learn the game, lots of coaches. At the end of the night, we would sit down and and uh, you know basically chalk talk. And a lot of times it was uh, with beer caps. We would just run plays with beer caps. And I remember meeting a guy named Larry Angus, who is a you know, legendary figure in the, in the Hamilton basketball scene. Kind of shared with him and said, hey, you know, I got this issue. Like, you know, we're small. We don't have a lot of size. At the time, our, our center was 6'5". And, uh, you know, what do you think? And, and he talked to me about five-out offense. And, uh, you know, I called it L.A., and uh, for the next nine years, a big, huge part of what we did at Eastern was we ran five out offense and we played the floor spread. Uh, everybody could attack and it was pretty simple. Just read the help. If the help vacated, attack the rim and then we would have some simple screening concepts that we built in. And then we drove that down into all levels of our program at Eastern. We would run it at the, the Bantam team with the Bantam team, midget team, we'd run it with the junior team. So by the time they came to, to me, um, to us, uh, they had a pretty good understanding of our 5L concept. So again, you know, pretty interesting journey. Then I leave Eastern and I go to Ryerson and, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to get better uh, as a university coach. Now I'm a professional coach. I'm doing this full time. And uh, I spent tons of time in the U.S. and NCAA programs, uh, picking up things here and there. But really what changed for me was uh, my time spending uh, – my time spent in, in Utah with Quinn Snyder. Uh, I did a summer league stint with, with him in his first year when he got the job. So I was lucky enough to be part of him implementing his system and really got a chance to see Quinn um, advance his, you know, kind of introduce to me what was really at the time I, I considered flow concepts. And uh, that was really impactful. I went again, two years later, I went to training camp again and kind of watched what he did, picked up his, you know, some of his terminology, some of the concepts, but but mostly watching him implement the system and, and how he flowed into it. And then obviously spent a lot of time in San Antonio as well, looking at their strong and weak, both on film, but also going to San Antonio and spending time there watching them implement their offensive system. So my Ryerson uh, time, nine years there, offensively, we changed a lot. You know, we kept evolving. And much of it was because of the influences that I was kind of putting myself around um, in the Canadian national team and also in the hoop summit because of such short preps, you know, we would have two and a half, three days to, to put in a, a, an offense. You know, we really, that's when I really started to dig into how do I make these opportunities to, you know, implement offense more really simple, you know? So we knew that, you know, in those environments, understanding how to attack a switch, uh, screen usage, spacing, all of those things that are real foundational elements of any offensive system, really the system became more about that. You know, it was really three or four simple things, but really digging into how we were going to attack what the defense uh, was doing to try and disrupt. So, you know, another interesting opportunity, I probably, you know, in the course of my career now, well, you know, coached for you know, put in about 100 different, you know, offense 100 different times from AU teams to high school teams to um, national teams, university teams, and now been part of designing uh, what we do here in Sacramento. And, uh, you know, the de design process here is, you know, obviously it's on steroids. It's very, very different. Um, lots of, uh, you know, much of it being led last year by uh, Igor Kokoshkov, who's now the head coach at Fenerbahce and is an offensive genius, uh, in my opinion, spent some time with, with Quinn Snyder in Utah as well. So lots of Utah influence in Igor as well. And now this year, we just, we've just hired uh, Alvin Gentry, who'll come in and, and, you know, he's been a long time five out coach. So, you know, in, in, in the NBA, we call five out delay. So really, how do we put, you know, design something that's really, really deep in a way that's simple uh, and brings a lot of clarity to our players. So I'll start to walk you through some of that. And then please, as we go, um, I, I want this to be as interactive as possible. So rather than me talking for a half an hour straight, if we can have questions as we go, happy to, happy to uh, share and give you as much as I can. So 
again, the design process, we, we you know, we've had people coming in here and, and helping us just on just the whole element of design and design thinking. So there's a huge piece of this is not even what you do, but how you design what you do and how does it reflect what you're trying to accomplish. So for us, you know, the first question that we have to ask is, you know, what, well, why are we, you know, why are we implementing a particular offense? Uh, and this goes beyond offense into everything that we do, but I'm just breaking this particular session down to offense. And obviously the number one thing at this level and for really all of us as coaches is winning, right? We're trying to win. Um, but then again, you know, there's a lot of different voices uh, at this level again. So style of play becomes one of those key questions. And in the NBA right now and in basketball in general, we hear a lot about you know, pace and space, um, you know, things of that nature. Can you win with a small ball lineup? We've seen what happened with Houston this year. And then we looked at what happened with, you know, with the Lakers who won the title by playing really big at times, which is almost kind of unique right now in the NBA. So, you know, do we have a, you know, uh, do we have alignment on the style of play that we, we want to, you know, we want to implement with our players? Does our roster match? So as you think about your teams, you know, what you want to do on offense, does it match the type of players that you have that you have? And then for us, again, very different because we have ownership and we have upper level management that also has a vision of what they want to uh, see happen on the floor. So there's lots of different voices. And how do we align those, those voices so that we can come up with a common purpose and then drive it uh, forward, which is really where we come into the idea of having clarity on what your particular offense or the style of play or system that you want to implement. How do you build clarity for your players? How do you build pl clarity for your coaches? How do you drive it down in player development? You know, do, does your performance staff understand the language that you use? I mean, there's, there's just tons and tons of stuff. And then the art form is how do you apply it, right? Your draw work, um, you know, and you know, a games-based approach. There's just so many different, different ways that we can talk about application, but pretty simple. You know, what do you do when you put it on the floor? How do you put it on the floor? Um, so we'll dig into some of these things, but mostly I just kind of want to walk you through that design process and how it's changed for me and, and how I'm now looking at the game here. It's, it's been somewhat, you know, simplified for this audience. It's a little bit deeper for us in the NBA right now, but you'll get a feel for it as we go forward. Okay. So I don't know how many of you have developed playbooks over the years. I don't know how many playbooks I've had. Uh, I, I've lost count. You know, typically in the past, our playbooks were done um, uh, on fast draw or in some type of, uh, you know, software where you can, and maybe on paper, you drop your plays and you just layer them and layer them and layer them. And uh, now, you know, with, with technology, there's so many different ways you can do them. And for us, a simple way that I've looked at is, you know, if we were to build out a playbook, how would we build out that, that playbook? How, do, how does that look? What are the chapters that are involved in that playbook? So the first one that I want to talk about is, is really conversion. And, and conversion is in some ways transition. Uh, it's a similar word, but often we talk about transition and we forget about really what gets us from the end of a possession or the change of a possession into an, an early attack. And for me, I've always looked at that as conversion and how do we how do we drive conversion? Because a big thing here in, uh, in, in Sacramento and big thing across the league is, you know, the, the tendency is to want to play fast. And uh, when I was at Ryerson, we played fast. And when I was at Eastern, we played fast and we encouraged our guys to push the ball, you know, and often uh, as a high school coach, you know, you would hear me yelling, you know, push, 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 or, you know, run or whatever that was. But I didn't really understand why I was saying it. I was just saying it because I wanted really in some ways just to play harder uh, and to play, you know, a good way is just to, you know, again, intensity and energy on both ends of the floor. But for us, often that was in our ability to break, you know, to get out on the break. So I want to dig into a little bit of that. Um, we'll talk about, you know, early offense, also called, you know, you can also call it secondary offense, talk about motion offense or flow. Um, and all of this for us is within the context of a 24 second shot clock. Go into a little bit of set play, uh, clutch and critical, which is, um, you know, I'll def define that for you. And, and I think it's important as coaches that you define that for yourselves and your teams. And then we'll talk a little bit about special teams play and what that entails. Okay. So 
conversion, uh, pretty simple. Conversion is basically every opportunity you have, uh, whether it's a dead ball, whether it's a rebound, uh, whether it's a made bucket, you know, how do you convert back to offense? So, you know, there's a lot of different language that we've used, uh, you know, over the years. Uh, Kirby Shep, who I think is on this call, uh, gave me a little bit of a, a light bulb moment when he talked a little bit about 1.5 concept. And uh, I'll share a little bit about 1.5 concept. So basically, uh, the moment that I get a rebound, you know, let's just say that the ball is now in my hands. Um, what do we look like as a group in the first one and a half seconds of that possession? Are we coming back to the ball to try and get an outlet? Are we standing and waiting for the first dribble, two dribbles to figure out where we're going to go? Or are we turning and busting out? So that's what I put in this, this idea of the first three strides. Some people talk about first two strides. Um, but what do we do, you know, how do we break out? How do we transition or how do we convert from defense to offense? Basically is, is that kind of idea. And uh, it's a great way to teach by showing what you look like in that moment to your players on film. So again, when we get to, uh, when we talk, another one I think is really important is I asked this, uh, this question of our, of our analytics group when I got here is, you know, because we, we, we talked a lot about playing fast. And I said, well, okay, you know, we talk about fast break, fast break, fast break. And, and I said, well, what is a fast break? Uh, how do we define a fast break in the NBA? And, uh, you know, again, another really powerful moment for me was fast break basketball is basically creating a numbers advantage. So anytime that you can get five on four, four on three, three on two, two on one, whatever that is, anytime that you have a numbers advantage, five on three, four on two, whatever that is, that's considered a fast break. So how do you trigger fast break basketball? And for, for me again, uh, and for us here, that's about our, our ability to convert. So I've put a couple of little uh, uh, definitions of how we convert. So, you know, a deep outlet, you know, when I was at Ryerson, we were, I was obsessive about, you know, having our, our outlet passes be above the free throw line extended. And we wanted our receiver of the outlet pass to be on the sideline, closer to the sideline with his butt and shoulders to the sideline. So once he got that pass, he could immediately see the floor. So we wanted those deep outlets as much as we could. Now, interesting enough here, again, another thing to think about as you're designing your offensive system is, you know, who do you want to inbound the ball? And uh, that still is a little bit of a, you know, it's been, uh, it's changing rapidly. Typically, traditionally in the past, it's usually been most people say, okay, we want our four man in because you want your four man to be the trail. Uh, sometimes it could be a five man because you want your five man to flow into some type of uh, early offense, whether that's a drag screen and we'll get into those types of things. Um, but now what we're seeing a lot of teams do is just the closest man, just inbound the ball and go, which impacts the way you run your lanes uh, and how do you want to spread. So we're seeing a lot more now in the NBA is that you know, a quick inbound and just everybody run outside the three-point line. Space the floor as quickly as you can. The idea of the rim runner, um, not as prevalent as it's been in the past. Uh, you know, the idea of running your first big to the rim and sealing and then dumping it inside, not really taught too much anymore because of, again, the, the value of a post-up. So, you know, the game is changing a little bit and the, the ability to get the ball inbound quick could potentially create a numbers advantage. Uh, has become a really, really important part of the game as well. So pass ahead in transition, um, pretty simple. Just get the ball up the floor as quickly as you can, right? The ball should always be in the lead. A dribble push. You now I said, who are our push guys? Because on your teams, you know, if you want to push the ball up the floor, depending on what level you are, um, who is that person or who are those, those players on your team? For us, pretty simple. When De'Aaron Fox has the ball in his hands, we want him to push it. He's our dribble push guy. And, uh, you know, where Corey Joseph might be more of a pass ahead guy. Uh, De'Aaron has license to just go and attack because he's electric and maybe one of the best end to end players in the league with the ball in his hands, especially from a speed perspective and athleticism perspective. So think about who those people are on your team that you want to give license to push it. And it might be all of them. Uh, it doesn't have to be a point guard. It could be a, a really athletic five man or a four man who's got a, you know, a good handle and, and, can, and can push the ball up the floor. And then again, uh, you know, where do you run your lanes and, and where do you put your bigs or bigs is probably the big one. You know, we've had uh, 
last year we we had our bigs play in an area that we call the reed spot which was kind of in and around the you know the elbow extended uh, more for uh, secondary pick and rolls in transition uh, typically traditionally bigs will run rim and then get to the dunker and now with teams like milwaukee again with five out delay you're seeing guys like brooke lopez running to the to the corner so we're running you know you're running your bigs outside the three-point line and spreading the floor um, and then finally for us in conversion is you know, we, we want to get the ball over half court in a particular amount of time. And, and we've talked about this and uh, for us, it was three seconds. So we've, we've charted this and just to try and get one, to try and get a numbers advantage in transition, but two, most importantly, um, use more, you know, get, be more efficient with the shot clock. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, give you a couple of examples here. If I can, here we go. So just so you get a visual of this, of what it looks like. I call these triggers. These are our triggers for, uh, you know, a fast break, gaining a numbers advantage. The best one and easiest way when people talk about, you know, I want to be a fast break team. Um, you got to force turnovers. It's pretty simple. And now, as I look back to my time as a high school coach, it was one of the reasons why we were so successful because we pressed so much. We were, you know, one, two, one, one full court, trap the first pass, force turnovers. And we just punish people by getting numbers advantages and, and then scoring off of them. Now, as the level gets higher and players get better, it's a little bit more difficult to just press constantly for, you know, the full game and just turn people over and try to beat them that way. But certainly running on turnovers is a big one. Anytime you get a turnover, you should be looking to score off of it. So. And I, I want you to just pay attention to the 1.5. What do we look like in that first one and a half seconds? Good breakout. Again, so now we're talking about running on makes, right? And we talked about this quick inbound concept and Darren's really, really good at this. Just gets it, flip it back to him and he's gone. Dribble push, who's your dribble push guy? It's pretty special to have an athlete like that. Again, so we talk about deep outlets. Again, we're, we're trying to create a numbers advantage. We're trying to attack as quickly as we can to create a numbers advantage. Here we go. So three on two. Okay, great deep outlet. Another quick inbound. It's our push guy. Good spacing of the floor. And again, what, what we're seeing more and more at all levels of basketball is that transition three is, is you know, is pretty deadly. And again, I go back to my time at Ryerson. We, you know, our best teams at Ryerson were teams that were just, you know, if we had an opportunity to shoot the transition three, we didn't think twice. It was just out. And regardless of whether we made it or missed it, I just continued to encourage them to shoot that shot. Um, so, you know, it's not always about attacking for layups. Uh, often it's attacking for open threes as well. So hopefully that gives you an idea of um, kind of some of the triggers um, for conversion for us, how we try to get into a transition game. And often we talk about, you know, what we're going to run on offense and our plays and all of those things, but we don't focus in on the simple things like who's inbound of the ball, how are we inbound of the ball, how are we running our lanes, where do we want our outlet pass to go, who do we want pushing it up the floor, and, you know, we always want the ball to be in the lead, pass ahead. And I think, you know, as you start to design your, your offense, Think about those things because they're really, really important. They can generate a ton of scoring for you without necessarily having to spend so much time on uh, particular offensive plays, if we want to call them that. Okay. Oh, let me move on to the next slide here. Here we go. So now early offense. So again, you know, we've we've tried to get it up the floor in transition. You know, we've converted 
rate 1.5, not there. We don't have those numbers advantage. Again, so for us here, um, early offense is really limited play calling. Luke is not a, a big play caller, wants us to play out of, well, he's, he's actually a, a very good play caller, but he wants us to play free. He wants us to, um, to play in a nice rhythm and we do have a lot of shooting. So it's an opportunity for us to kind of get out and, and, and get into some offensive concepts pretty early. And typically this is where drag screens come into play, single pin downs, wide, wide pin downs, double, uh, double drags. And then a dribble drag is basically where the ball handler just dribbles it and hands it off to a wing who will come off of a quick pick and roll. And then off ball points and quicks, they're different angles of screens that are set, but typically, and we'll, you'll see some film on this, um, what's happening now, there's so many drop coverages in the NBA where the big is retreating and just waiting and kind of zoning up, uh, which means they can't get out on shooters. So if you look at somebody like uh, Damian Lillard, who's such a good shooter coming off a of pick and roll or coming off of any type of screen, if the big is not up, up to touch or up in that area, uh, it's almost a clean look almost every time. And he's such a good shooter. So in some ways, shooting is also beginning to change defensive coverages in the NBA because bigs can no longer just drop. You have to have the ability to get up in this, you know, up into the screener and hedge it, or shock it. Uh, to be able to kind of disrupt shooters because there's just so many good guys, Trey Young, Steph Curry, guys coming off screens that, you know, if they have any type of space, it going up and they're going up from deep. And then back cuts and face cuts are things that, you know, dribble at a guy, go back door. Uh, there's a lot of that that's kind of in the flow of early offense. So again, you know, we it, typically early offense happens in this kind of range in the shot clock, um, the first six to eight seconds. And, you know, you'll get a feel for it. A couple of longer clips here um, that kind of are, are maybe misplaced, but we'll walk you through them anyway. I'll, I'll say goodbye. I gotta go so, sorry. I don't know why this is going back. Hang on a second here. Sorry, guys, I knew there would be some glitches. Okay, so perfect. Again, so we call this a point. So you can see us flowing down the floor. There is no uh, numbers advantage. And the big one, you'll see the big, who I think here is um, uh, Brooklyn's big, I'm forgetting his name now. Uh, young bigs had a, a great, uh, great season. And typically a great drop big. So again, a way to attack a drop big with early offense is to just set this point screen. Now quick, just a quick screen on the wing, come off of it, not there, and then we just kind of play out of it. But the initial attempt was an early Again, so here's Shea Gilgus Alexander in an early drag. 19 seconds on the shot clock, come down the floor, look the floor spaced. We just drag him and play. Okay, so just a couple of quick examples of off ball screening or in early offense and on ball screening in early offense. And again, you know, it could be a double drag where there's two bigs coming into drag. It could be a guard to guard screen. We're seeing way more of those now. Um, in all of basketball, screening is no longer just the place for, you know, bigs. Uh, that big little screen has changed to guard to guard screens, uh, you, you know, small big screens. I mean, screening is very, very different. You know, I, at one point in time, you know, it was an almost insult for to tell a guard to go set a screen because they automatically assumed that they were, you know, being asked to be a big, um, especially at the younger levels. And now what we're seeing in the game is that, you know, screening is, screening action is, is positionless really. And, uh, you know, especially in early offense. So just a couple of quick examples of point screens, a quick screen, and then a drag screen in early offense to get your, get your offense going. Okay. And again, really, how are you building this into your offense? So how are you layering your offense? So we're going conversion transition, we're going to early offense, and then let's move on. So now, this is the area where I think we have like most opportunity because this is the area where, you know, it's just 
your opportunity to get your players to play. And uh, before I move into this, I'm just wondering, Adam, do we have anybody that wants to ask a question on those first two areas? Is there anything that we want to kind of get to? I see some questions. Yeah, there's three questions so far in the Q&A. You should see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Do you see that? Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Okay, you can click on that. You should see the three and you can, uh, I can read them off or you can read them and address them. And Sure, why don't you read um, them off? That's way better for me. Sure. Sure, the first one from Eric. Uh, any suggestions for junior high level offense? Most likely facing a 2-3 zone. Uh, we have size and I enjoy a high-low style. Also, how many plays would you suge suggest not to overwhelm? So again, that's junior high level. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about zone offense um, because I think it's a great conversation to have right now. One of the things that was really um, interesting to me um, was the fact that we, we're seeing more and more zone now at the NBA level than we've ever seen before. And, you know, Miami has really, I think since Dallas won the title with Dirk Nowitzki, it's the first time a team has played as much zone as they have uh, in the playoffs. And, you know, the Raptors played a ton of zone. Um, Boston played with some zone. And I think the one thing about zone offense, in my belief, is that, you know, basic good zone concepts um, are universal. So, you know, as far as plays are concerned, I mean, you can, you can screen the zone in many different ways. Uh, when I was a, a high school coach, I might have had one or two zone plays um, just to attack, you know, size because we were small. People would zone us up all the time, try to beat us that way. But I think the big one is this. Um, you know, an entry into the low post against the zone, dive your high post. So you're playing your high, high, low game. The Lakers did that against Miami. They were the first team that really started to attack through, um, through the post down low and uh, really, really changed uh, Miami's zone defense, just tore, tore them apart. And then the other thing too is, do you have great concepts when you get to the ball to the high post? So, you know, do you flatten out your wings? Uh, what do you do with your low post? Do you, do you send them to the rim? Do you send them to the gap? Do you play them out of the dunker? Whatever that is, whatever it is that you want to do to attack the zone, I think those basic concepts of spacing the zone with a, you know, with a high post and a low post, uh, you can exchange that high post. You can trade it off. You can do a lot of different things with it. But when the ball gets to a particular area, what do you do? And then, you know, really shot selection against the zone is really, really important. So I think your question about a high-low style is a great, you know, there's nothing wrong with a high-low style. High-low style is great. I would do it in the NBA. I think the key is, you know, making sure your athletes understand what to do when the ball gets into that area of the floor. And, you know, for Miami, again, I'm using an NBA team that, that's playing, a, you know, a basic zone defense. They, the thing that they did, which is a little different, is they had their, their smalls down low, you know, their smaller guards down low, and then they had their bigger guards up top to, to, to kind of add more length to the zone and really try to disrupt that way. But when the ball went into the high post against that zone, they basically went one-on-one -on -one with their big and everybody kind of stayed home. And they were going to live with, you know, the mid-range shot, uh, you know, the offense getting that shot. So on an, from an offensive perspective, you just kind of need to think about what it is you want to accomplish against the zone. But I would tell you again that uh, against the 2-3, High low is great. That's the way I would go, and then sprinkle in if if your team was smart enough, maybe sprinkle in some type of screening action against it, whether it was a ball screen up higher or a screen off the ball. So hopefully that answers that question. Adam, you want to let's keep going. I'm going to keep answering yep. these questions, and then we'll we'll move on. The second one from Eric was uh, how many plays, I guess, offensive plays would you suggest not as to not overwhelm a team? And again, he's speaking sort of a junior high, middle school perspective. Mm -hmm. So sorry again. That was a uh, sp spacing, right? No, how many one? plays? I guess no. How many offensive plays? It's the second part of the first question. How many offensive plays would you suggest? Oh, right, 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 right. I mean, wow, that that's a tough one. I mean, I would probably have as as few as I possibly could, and and really try and teach them how to play and not necessarily the plays, and then layer from whatever. Um, you know, whatever family uh, you want to start, whatever kind of base foundation you want to start. So if, whether that's a, a zipper set or a floppy set, which I'm not a big fan of floppy, but whatever that play is, can you stick with that formation and then add to it to a point where you're not overwhelming uh, your players? At the junior high level, you know, I, I wouldn't have too many. I, I, I'm not going to give you a number because I don't know your kids and I don't know how bright they are and how, how uh, 
how long you've been with them. You know, uh, I think there's a lot there, but less is always more on offense, even at this level. All right, we have a question from Nick. Um, looking to go into some greater detail on how you teach proper spacing when flowing into transition. Is it the first player out gets the furthest outside or do players have usual lanes they will run? Uh, how do you teach your players how to get to the cleanest five out spacing possible? Into the five, is, sorry, into the cleanest five out spacing possible. Yeah, I think it's that's a big communication one. Now, again, you can, uh, you know, what we what we call script, uh, you know, you can circle them up, shoot a free throw, and then have them break out the other end, and, and then, you know, do it that way. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can apply drill work into your spacing. So I would tell you this is that whatever you're going to do, communication, even on offense, becomes really, really important. There is no set rule in five out spacing. It, you know, uh, it's just get to the spots as quickly as you can. So if you want to put, you know, a couple of X's down on the floor, uh, you know, five X's down on the floor and you want to get them there as quickly as you can, maybe they talk their way through it. You know, the challenge becomes when, you know, you have a flood of guys on the ball side or you have an empty side where nobody's running that lane. How do you fill those spots? And that might be more about, the, you know, the ball changing and getting into the middle third and then rebalancing your your players to a particular spot. I don't think there's any one particular correct answer because the key is you want to break out as quickly as you can. So sometimes even having an empty side where the lane hasn't been filled is not a bad thing in transition offense. You know, often we talk about, hey, we need to, you know, have our guys in all the different spots. Well, that's not necessarily the case, especially at this level. The key is, you know, the the intensity the pace that you're trying to attack in transition is far more important than, than necessarily that spacing. So an empty side is an opportunity. Um, but I would say from a five out perspective, in a lot of different ways to do it, but I think communication on offense between players is really, really important in their ability to read each other. And then I might just at that level, put some X's on the spot on, on the spots and have them get there as quickly as they can. And then talk about it when they, you know, two of them end up on the same spot. How did that happen? Okay. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So Adam, you know what, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep moving and then I'll do the second. Uh, the, yeah. The four out one in um, offense for creating movement and building a foundation. Okay. So let me, let me just keep going before I totally lose my, my train of thought. So flow motion again, right now we're in a situation where we've, We've started in our conversion, in our transition. We're trying to attack to get a numbers advantage. That's that's what we're trying to do. We, we want to create, you know, five on three, uh, four on two, whatever that is. Not there. Well, we're trying to get something early in the clock within the first, you know, three to six seconds. And we're taking advantage of a retreating defense. And maybe we can get a quick shot. Maybe we can get a quick ball screen before they're set and attack that way. That's not there. And now we're into our flow action where we're really, we know we're in five on five play. We're not going to be able to create an advantage, but we want to create a rhythm in our offense. You, we don't want our offense to stall out where we now start to walk it up the floor um, and, and play that way. And I will say that, again, these are just chapters. Uh, these can be looked at as menus. If you don't have a team that is very talented and very skilled, you may not want to play any type of flow or motion offense. You may want to remove this from your group. So this is not to suggest that you have to use every single one of these areas. You decide how you want to design your offense and flow for, you know, a team that really is, has, you know, two players and, and three players that aren't very skilled. I mean, obviously if they're young, you want to develop them. So you want probably want to continue to play flow so they can develop in that area and everybody touches the ball and plays and can read the game. But at the same time, I can share with you that, you know, Larry Brown, when the Pistons won the title with, uh, with Chauncey Billups in that group, it was pretty clear, Igor was on that staff, that, you know, they were going to try and get an early push in transition to see if they could get a score. And if not, they were going to play set. They were going to play set play. They were going to slow it down because they didn't feel like they had the roster to play the flow types of actions that San Antonio and Utah and and some of those teams could play. Now, this was obviously a different time, but even what we're seeing now in places like Utah with Quinn Snyder, 
they're changing. They're less flow, more just kind of early spread pick and roll. Um, even San Antonio is kind of moving away from that. And analytics is driving a lot of the things that we're now starting to see in, on, on offense as well. Like, I mean, I think if you watch the playoffs this year, there wasn't a lot of, you know, ball changing sides, multiple passes, attack, drive, kick. There wasn't a lot of that type of game. You know, it was an early attack and then it became very personnel based. But, but I think there is a place for flow and motion offense. And again, in the context of a shot clock. Okay. So away action, I'll just kind of talk you through it is basically a stagger, stagger away. You know, can you come down the floor and stagger away, initiate your action that way? Open action is really more of a way to open up the floor with your big in a read in, in that kind of elbow area. Uh, delay action is five out basically. And then strong and weak is basically San Antonio's kind of reversal action where they'll reverse it through the trail, swing it to the second side, and then get into whatever action that they decide they want to get into. Typically, again, they would reverse it into a stagger. That was San Antonio strong. And then, you know, think about, you know, your entries often. So when I was at Ryerson, uh, we had no play calls. I would just say, hey, flow, 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 as they were coming down the floor. And we knew that on a wing entry, we were going to do this. If the ball was reversed, we were going to do this. If we dh would it, dri dribble handoff, we would do this. And if we pushed the guy through to empty out the side, the wing in front of us, we would be in a particular offense. So the entry determined what offense we were in while we were in flow and motion down the floor, if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. Okay. Here we go. So some examples of flow. Okay, again, here's Miami flowing into their delay. Bam's, oh, geez, sorry. Um, You know, Bam Adebayo has become somewhat of a superstar because of his ability to play this spot, even though he's a non-shooting big. You know, Giannis, again, non-shooting big who can really pass. We're seeing a lot of those guys become really, really valuable in five-out offense as initiators of offense. They're just flowing into it. They have a split action. Again, not necessarily designed for one player. So six point Miami lead. Let's go downstairs to Rebecca. Yeah, Spear, defensively, the Pacers are doing a lot of things well. They've got balance between their interior defense. And then here's San Antonio Strong. Right, they just reverse it. There's the stagger. Play off the stagger. Not there. Quick pick and roll, spacing. And not the greatest shot. Again, out of the stagger, they reject it. Now they see the mismatch. And they're going to exploit the mismatch. This is a play that actually should go in the next segment, but I'll, I'll talk you through it. It's misplaced. Um, again, a great, a great set or a great play to attack a switch. And all we're trying to do is make sure that we can get the switch on the guy that we want. So this is, again, more of an advantage play. I'll talk about that in a minute. So Harrison Barnes gets the switch. And we just dribble it back to the other side using kind of a, a fake ball screen. Obviously, they're going to go under here, enter it. And then now we've got the switch down low on the box. And we throw it into Harrison and attack the switch down low. So again, we know that the switch is coming. We're going to counter the switch by going to this particular play to get, uh, you know, our, our small forward, a post up who, who enjoys it on that block against a smaller defender. And this leads me into um, set play advantage. Again, if there's any questions, Adam, I'll, I'll, I can chip away at those now. Okay, we got two more in here. Uh, for seventh and eighth grade teams, is there a particular offense such as a four out, one in pass and cut offense that you recommend for creating movement and building a foundation early on in the season? At the middle school level. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of value in four out and I'll tell you why. I mean, the, the one in is, uh, you know, you, you can do a lot of things with that that one in, you can lift him to the to the you know to the free throw line. You can put him down low. You can bring him to the top and make it five out. So how you want to utilize the one in is really the one that is uh, is the uh, is somewhat the challenge because it can can 
it can also kind of clog up your spacing. Um, but what I would say is the, the four out cutting offense is a, also a great way to drill your defense. Most people talk about shell drill concepts on defense. If you just cut and, you know, cut and space um, out of a four out, really teaching those principles of when to attack. And then obviously what you need to think about is when you have one in, when you throw it into the post or when you throw it into that one player, what do you want to do there? So I don't, there isn't a particular offense. I, I'm not necessarily, I've never really been a four out one in guy. Uh, although, you know, obviously in transition, if you have a rim runner, uh, you might want to put him in the dunker. You might want to put him in the post. Uh, I think for, for youth teams at the seventh and eighth grade level, if I was coaching, you know, my kids, I'd want them to play five out regardless of whether my big kid was, um, you know, slower uh, you know I, I look at what what would Kelly Olynyk be right now if you know he was a four out, if he was the one in on a four out system for many many years you know one of the strengths that Kelly's always had he's always been the biggest guy on the team is, is he's always had the freedom to to be creative and play outside and and attack off the dribble and shoot the ball you look at Anthony Davis you look at all these players now that are super skilled five men uh, or super skilled big guys they've all kind of grown up playing in a system that allowed them space and allowed them to play on the perimeter. So four out one in great, you can do a ton of things with it. Not a bad offense at all, in no means. Uh, I, I don't think there's a particular, um, you know, I, I just say I'd probably be more about spreading it out and playing more five out than four out one in with a seventh and eighth grade team. And then that way you can really, um, you know, create movement, you can build your plays out of that. You can teach penetration principles. You can really teach the game from a spacing and attacking perspective. Um, Adam, do you want me to do AJ? AJ. AJ. Or, yeah. You want to do that one around? Sure. Uh, what here. does the dialogue look like when talking about what is a good shot versus a bad shot at the NBA level? How can coaches best teach or explain that at various levels? Good shot versus bad shot. Yeah. I mean, that's the art of coaching, right? How do you talk to, uh, you know, a player? I mean, it's very different. Or, you know, I don't know how you talk to Kawhi Leonard about good shot, bad shot. You know, you just, you got to kind of live with it. But I think the key thing is, in some ways, uh, you know, use of film is so important. And I know that, you know, for, for coaches at younger levels, it might be more difficult, but there's more and more opportunities now. You know, I walk into the gym, every parent is taping games on their iPhones or, you know, on their, there's just so many things. And it's, it's work. Um, but can you teach through film? I think the film is probably the most important one because it can, it can really, um, you know, bring to light what you're talking about, right? You paint a picture, like what is a good shot and what is a bad shot? And then the other thing AJ, I think is important is obviously, you know, this is kind of telling them beforehand, you know, what is a good shot and what is a bad shot? And I think right now in the NBA, the big one is, you know, is the mid range shot a good shot or a bad shot is the mid range shot, um, in any situation, a good shot or a bad shot. And for certain players, you, you got to let them play. Like they, they, they need to be able to get a shot off and especially late in the clock or maybe their skill set. DeMar DeRozan was an incredible mid-range shooter. You know, are you going to tell him every time he shoots a mid-range shot, it's a bad shot? It's not going to happen. So I think there's some individual dialogue. I think there's some knowing who your players are. I think there's teaching through film as much as you can. Uh, and I'll just share a quick story for you. You know, we, I don't even remember what game we were on. We were we were on the uh, plane coming back and I think we had, we had lost early in the season and I just decided, okay, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to watch every possession in this game. And I'm going to chart what I think is a good shot or a bad shot. Cause I thought we took horrible shots that night. And then I went through the film and I, I basically, you know, clipped and charted and graded every shot. And I came out of there thinking, actually, you know what? We might've taken seven or eight bad shots all night. And when you consider the number of possessions in an NBA game, that wasn't bad. It was a lot better than I thought it was. So I would say as well, as sometimes we believe that shots are, you know, we're taking bad shots, but until we watch it and go through it, you know, possession by possession in a game, um, it's, it, you know, it's revealing. And I often used to say to my teams at Ryerson is that, you know, if I can count the number of bad shots we take in a night, uh, you know, on, on more than one hand, if it's more than five, then, you know, we're going to, we're going to have to have a conversation about it. So again, how do you frame that conversation about good versus bad and then, how do you kind of, you know, evaluate that? So film is a huge one. I, 
I don't I want to go to like uh, Eric because I don't want to. He was first on the list, and uh, you want to read that one out for us, Adam? Uh, I thought we caught that one. What drills the, uh, make post entry difficult? That was um, that was a question to Sefu earlier. Oh, okay, okay, still perfect. hanging in Good. All right, the Sounds answer. Good. So, okay, perfect. But I think Coach Becker is going to have one on here in a moment, so maybe just carry on with uh, your okay. slides there. So, so again, we'll so we're, we're now back in um, in into the uh, into design of the system in system design, right? So we've talked about conversion transition, we've talked about early offense, we've talked about flow. How do we flow? And now what I like to call advantage and, and really a lot of people, okay, we're going to run a set. Okay. We're, we're going to run a play. Well, when, when do you run plays and why do you run plays? So the first one is, you know, really when you can't create an advantage on a dead ball, ball goes out of bound, the ref brings the ball in and, you know, gives you the ball, you bring it in. And sometimes you can do it quickly, but for the most part, it's a dead ball set. So you're walking it up the floor or you're jogging up the floor and you're five on five. There's no numbers advantage. And what are we doing there? What are we trying to accomplish? And often again on makes, sometimes teams aren't as intentional of running on makes. They may want to come up the floor and really kind of have something that they want to take advantage of. <clears throat> and again, you know, why are you running a set play? This is why I call it an advantage. You know, are we trying to take advantage of our speed? Are we trying to take advantage of our size? Are we trying to punish a switch? Uh, do we have a particular screening action? We want to free up our our shooters, uh, do we want to attack from a particular area of the floor? So, you know, stampedes are basically, um, basically passing it from one end of the floor to the other end of the floor and driving it as hard as you can at a gap to try and get to the rim and draw a foul or, you know, maybe get a score. And typical, uh, you know, I used to call this touchdown. We call them stampedes here because I wanted the, the idea of when you catch it, you're trying to score a touchdown. You're trying to get to the rim as fast as you can. Um, you know, typically this is a good thing to do when a team is very close. You want to force them into foul, you know, into the bonus, pick up their fourth team foul, next trip down the floor, you run some type of a touchdown play, some type of a stampede play where you know you're going to get something attacking the rim and really put them on their heels. Because if they draw a foul, now you're in the bonus in FIBA competition. Now you can keep shooting for the rest of the quarter. So, and then again, you know, are you screening for your shooters? What type of screens? Um, I've just kind of put some terminology in there you know a new york screen in our situation is when you set a screen and then the guy you immediately rescreen and bring them back to the ball for a shot so there's a lot of those types of things and then are you running a cutting action again falcons are basically backdoor lobs they're screening for a backdoor lob and then there's lots of different cutting actions 45 cuts back cuts face cuts i'm not going to get too deep into all this stuff because i don't want to get i know the you know i don't want to confuse people but again what are you running what are you, why are you running the plays you're running? You know, so if you're running a horn set, you know, what are you trying to accomplish in that horn set? You know, where do you want the ball? Who do you, whose hands do you want the ball in? And then if there is a particular coverage, how are you attacking that coverage? Okay, let me see if I can get this thing moved now. There we go. So give you a little, little, you know, flavor for some dead ball stuff here. This is after uh, a free throw. Now, again, sorry, keep doing this. Um, after free throws are another opportunity because they change the tempo and flow. So you could have after free throw plays. I had them at Ryerson a lot where we would just, they knew, you know, going into the quarter, this was our after free throw play. After every free throw, we didn't, there was no play call. We were just going to come up the floor and we were going to do this. You can see the tempo is very, very different now. Pretty well a dead ball tempo. But again, pretty good after free throw play for us. We call this cough action. Little handoff into a ball screen. That's Buddy healed. Pretty tough shot. And again, that was taken. We could talk, we'll talk a little bit about clutch critical time. That was taken with about three and a half minutes left in the game. So, you know, what are you running in those situations as well? So here we're running some split action. Again, Harry Giles, really, really good passer. We want to put you know, two pretty good offensive player in a split action and try to create confusion on the defense. This was in the bubble. And they were switching. 
both to the ball. We get a clean shot for you know our our best shooter. Now again, dead ball advantage sideline out of bounds. This one's particularly you know it's in the first quarter. This isn't necessarily a late game situation. Um, this is Denver. Jamal Murray. Jokic. Okay, so they're playing out of their two best players, but they're running a little bit of misdirection. And what they're trying to do is get the defense uh, on its heels relaxed. And this is what we call a face cut. I talked a little bit about back cut. So Murray is a little bit of almost, you know, false action going one way. Jokic turns such a great passer and then just face cut it. So again, some, some, you know, opportunities or some um, visuals on what set play can look like as you add it and layer it into your offensive system. Any, uh, any questions there? Did Dan get his question up? Yeah, we got uh, two there actually. The first is Kirby. Kirby Shep, what is the biggest focus of your player development program with the Kings? Video work, training fundamental skills, developing players for their specific roles or any other areas? So Player development program. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, it's all, I think the challenge is, um, you know, it's very individualized as well. So I can just give you an idea of what um, kind of a typical player development program in the NBA looks like, you know, probably the biggest focus in some ways is just the uh, strength and, and, and fitness and, and health of our, of our group. So, you know, we have a, a whole department, which is our health and performance department, whose main sole purpose is to keep players on the floor. I think it's incredible that we have, you know, players that can play 82 games uh, in a year with all the travel and all the demands of practice as well. So the first and foremost thing is to create, you know, healthy athletes, both mentally and physically, can, that can be available to play and on the floor. So a typical day for us on a practice day, uh, to some degree on a game day, we have different kind of formats that we use. Uh, players may come in as early as 9 a.m. and get on the training table and start to get work done on their bodies by our physical therapists, our athletic therapists, and then they'll jump into the weight room and work with our strength and conditioning coach. Then they'll get on the court and they'll work with our player development coach. So for the, for example, with Rashawn Holmes, big thing for Rashawn is, you know, we want to get him better in you know, a short roll passer, uh, I, I want to get him better finishing underhand. He's very, very good. His floater game is very, very good. So we want to get him better finishing underhand. Um, and then just overall shooting for him. Now, again, the other thing at this level is this is a collaboration. This isn't necessarily coaches saying, hey, I need you to do this, this, and this. A lot of it is, hey, what do we want to work on together? What do you want to get better at? So for a particular player, it might be to try and extend his range to the three-point line because he's not a three-point shooter yet. For another player, it might be about, you know, becoming a better finisher with his left hand. What, whatever that is, I think it's a collaboration with players. And uh, role clarity is obviously um, a big one. I'm working with a, a, our second round pick, Justin James, right now. He's a young player. And defense is really important for him because we know that the better, you know, he gets defensively even in our in, in the off season, the more opportunity he will have to play, hopefully, come next year. So I think it's role, role clarity and role definition is a huge part of that. And then I would just add Kirby. The other thing too is, you know, the breakdowns conceptually, you know, you saw a split action where Buddy got a wide open three. Uh, if we're gonna run a lot of splits next year, are we, are we drilling splits when we get an opportunity in the off season? Mm -hmm. Are we teaching it? You know, we'll send film. Obviously, things are very different right now with the pandemic on what we can do and how often we can do it. But certainly, uh, again, film is becoming more important. Important technology is becoming more and more important. So I, I hope uh, I hope that gives you a little bit of a, a feel for for what we do here. But all of those things are important, and film work getting more and more important. Okay, we got uh, Dan Becker question here for you, Roy. What drill work? Would you find works best for training that with that that quick push mentality? Uh, love the concept of quick inbounds on makes and want to build that out. Yeah, I mean, I think the best thing there is just um, you know, especially at, at a level where you know you're you're able to really drive accountability. Um, 
and, and be, and you can just do it your, yourself. Like you can just demand that, Hey, I think a lot of that is done in live play. I don't know if there's a drill that you can use. Um, it might be a free throw drill, you know, shoot the free throw, get a ball and bound and get up the floor as quickly as you can. Uh, but I would say a games based approach to something like this is probably the one that has the most transference and then really just being relentless in demanding that, you know, you get the ball over half court as quickly as you can, whatever time that is. Now, again, how do you want the ball inbounded? Who do you want to inbound it? If it, there isn't a designated inbounder, then really it's about that 1.5. What do you look like in the first one and a half seconds of the clock uh, as you convert from offense to defense? But I would do it in game situations. I would do it in scrimmages. I would do it in, in you know, free throw games or whatever, half a half court possession, a full court possession and stop, whatever that is, half one and done, whatever those drills that you kind of use but I would make that the emphasis. I don't think the drill is really necessarily the magic. It's just relentless emphasis on having them do it every time. And this last one, um, Adam, the less than 10 seconds on the clock. Uh, I will, uh, I'm gonna talk about this in clutch critical. So hopefully this will, uh, will answer this question uh, as we go through the next segment. So, let me get back All right. here. Sounds good. Let me get back here. So again, in the NBA, you know, clutch time in the NBA is uh, five minutes left in a game, uh, with and the game is within five points. So you know, what is what is it at your level? You know, in the FIBA game at Ryerson again, I kind of looked at the last three minutes um, because we kind of had to use a timeout and then anything under two, we were able to advance it. So for us, critical was that late game area where we were trying to win those games within the game. So determine what that is for you and then decide what it is that you want to do. So typically what we're seeing is really, really, this is getting really, really simple now in the NBA because it's really about using personnel more than anything else. The key thing is, is what analytics has shown is the more passes that you make, um, the more chances you have to turn over the ball. So, you know, offenses are getting more and more conservative for that reason. You don't see a lot of multiple pass possessions in clutch critical time. You're seeing, team, you know, coaches being much more conservative and really just trying to get the ball in their best player's hands and then play through that, either the switch, because there's so much switching going on, or just playing through the talent of a particular player, right? And we see that over and over again. Lakers had LeBron and AD. Miami had Jimmy Butler. And maybe their weakness was they did not necessarily have a second uh, shot creator, guy who could really go make shots. And we saw Jamal Murray become a star because of what he was able to do late game and clutch critical time with Jokic. So again, becoming much, much more personnel based. Two man actions, guard to guard. We see Boston doing a ton of this with Kemba and Jason Tatum, uh, Jalen Brown a little bit, just you know, guard to guard screen, peel out, force to switch, space the floor and attack. Three man actions could be, you know, a pistol action where you throw it ahead and, and now you have, you know, you can get the pitch back and then a flare and then a, a follow into a ball screen. Shoulder actions are basically Spain pick and roll. And again, this may be going above and beyond a lot of people, but if just just bear with me. Um, basically a pick and roll with someone setting a back screen for the roller and then exiting out as quickly as they can again forcing confusion. Not a lot of that happening late game. Most I'd see right now is two man actions. Um, and then again, when we talk about clutch critical, sometimes those are late clock. What are we doing late clock? And then again, in the FIBA game, what are you doing on an offensive rebound? Okay, so I'll just walk you through some film here. So again, you're, shit, I keep doing this. Um, This is with, you know, now again, this isn't necessarily clutch critical. We're, we're, we're playing this late game, we're trying to get back in this game, but it's an idea of the type of action. This is a free man action, you know, a, a down screen into a pin down, guard peels out, big follows and slips out of that screen. So that, that's a common action that the teams will run late game. And here you go, guard to guard, you know, this is Clippers. Paul George just trying to get a switch. So a lot of that, not, not necessarily a great shot. And then again, what are you running? Uh, if you have to advance the ball, what are you running late game? What's your, what's your SOB package? 
So typically what I would have done again at Ryerson and even with our national team, uh, before I went into a game, I would have three or four late game options, you know, need a three, need a two, need to get it in, um, whatever that was. And I would actually go before the game, probably, you know, a couple hours before the game, I would just get my board out and I would draw them up and I would get my reps four, five, six times. So that I knew that if I took a late game timeout and I advanced it, I'd already kind of done the work. I had gotten the reps, just like our players are getting the reps. I think it's important for us coaches to get reps. How often are you just drawing up plays on a game day that you know you're going to lose late, use late? And then I would have my card, take a look at my card. I knew what I was going to run. I would step on the floor in a timeout. I was much more calm because we understand that those are high pressure situations. Sometimes you can be anxious. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I had my rep, you know, my reps done before I got into that situation and walk into my timeout and run the play that we needed. But it's important that you have those things, especially if you're in FIBA and you're able to advance the ball late game. And if you're not, then, you know, what plays do you want to run down the stretch in critical opportunities? So here's Boston, you know, Miami, Boston again in overtime. Oh, let me get back to that. Sorry. Again, right into that two-man action. They wanted to get the switch. They didn't. Here Obviously, Bam's Ball block was huge in that. And now, again, in the NBA, because you can throw it behind half court, you can change the spacing on the sideline out of bounds. And again, just trying to get it into your best player. This is a, a tie game, so there's, you know, the risk is a little less. Against Barrett, three seconds, the three, got Again, two man action, space the floor. This is a great one for us, great win for us in Houston. So again, in your package, as you're designing out your offense, what do you have for your team when the game's tight and on the line, basically? What are you going to run? What are you going to do with your players? Who's all, you know, who do you want the, the ball to be in whose hands? And how do you want it to get there? And do you want to run some type of misdirection? Do you want to force a switch? Do you want to change the feet of the defender so you might be able to get a downhill drive? Do you want to run a quick off-ball action? You know, they put that last clip with, with Caruso hitting the three, you know, just put it in LeBron's hands. He's like a magnet. Everybody starts to draw in on him because they think he's going to either attack or shoot. Then he kicks out for a wide open three. So I think it's, uh, you know, those things are, are things to think about as you design your offense. Adam, I saw somebody raise their hand. Maybe I, did I answer that question, Spencer? Hopefully I did. I think you did. I'm okay. going to see what we got for, uh, and razors. I think it was him. I think it was uh, Spencer. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep going. This is this is the last uh, little slide that I have, and then it's all questions from here. So, you know, special teams is an area where I think there's a, a real opportunity. One of the things that I did a lot of Ryerson was game within the game. So we we kind of broke the game down in you know number of dead ball opportunities. You know, so we know that at the beginning of every quarter. The beginning of the half, uh, timeouts. You have a certain amount of timeouts. You know that you're going to have those opportunities to run a particular, what we call an after timeout play. Um, you know what are you doing there, and how is that? Uh, how are you? You know how efficient are you there? And we would chart it. You know I would always look at how did I do against the team that I played, and uh, so something to think about. You know how are you really bucketing those plays? And are you charting your efficiency and effectiveness in those plays? Every time you get a chance to draw a timeout, uh, drop a, an ATO and after timeout play, you know, how are you doing? Is there one that's really worked particularly well for you? Baseline out of bounds, sideline out of bounds, after free throws. 
Uh, those are other opportunities. And I, I call those set pieces, much like in soccer, where you have a free kick, a corner kick, penalty shots. Those things are very similar, you know, in, in a baseline out of bounds, it's, you know, it's basically like throwing it into the post. You know, your guy underneath the rim is making a pass from basically what you might have as a post entry. So what kind of actions are you running to get a great shot from that area of the floor? What kind of actions are you running to get a great shot from the sideline out of bounds? Again, a set piece. One of the things that we talked a lot about at Ryerson was uh, defensively against set pieces, against sideline out of bounds, against baseline out of bounds, and sometimes against uh, after timeout plays was we did not want to give them a shot in the first two passes because most uh, plays are designed to get you that shot within the first two passes. So we forced them to a third pass. Pretty well, we blew up that play. So for us on offense, you know, what's your first option and what's your second option? You know, one of the best players that I, I coached at Ryerson was a guy named Manny Durisa. He's you know, had some back issues, but super, super talented. And I used to always, you know, we had a lot of, we had a lot of battles over the years because I would draw up a timeout and he would come out of the timeout, get the ball, and then he would kind of call for a pick and roll or, you know, and, and I had to tell him like, look, if we're drawing this up, we're drawing this up for you to get a shot. So on the catch, you need to shoot it. It's not drawing it up for you to make a decision. The, the timeout is to get you the shot. And if that shot's near there, then this is option two. We want to get that shot. So think about how you, when you draw up your timeouts or your baseline out of bounds or your sideline out of bounds, if it's a set piece, you want to try and get a score after the first pass or second pass. Think about that. Two for ones, you know, whatever you want to call them. This is an area of the game with, you know, far, far more advanced here in the NBA. Players are far more advanced in the NBA than, than I ever was in, in FIBA competition or even at Ryerson. I wasn't a great two for one guy, but something to have. Uh, that can have tremendous value and how you communicate that and what you want that to be. It could be a quick ball screen. Uh, it could be an isolation, it could be whatever, but just being mindful of those opportunities to gain one extra possession, really, really important. Press attack. We're starting to see more and more presses being run here in the NBA, but I mean, obviously at the younger levels, some teams, that's all they do. So how do you attack pressure? And then the question that was asked earlier is how do you attack zone? So we're seeing a ton of that happening now. Zone is increasing in the NBA. How do you attack it? High, low, screening. Philosophically, some teams are about, oh, we're just going to run our plays at it. Um, I've always been more traditional. I like the idea of attacking it through particular areas of the floor or screening it in a particular area in order to get a particular shot. I'm not a big just run our play at the zone, but some coaches love that too. Um, okay, I, I, you know, I, I'll go back to that first. This is it. Now, again, I mean, we, we have a lot more depth in our playbook. Uh, I would say, you know, I can't even count, but we, we have to have probably 150 things that we have. And that's, that's, you know, not even including all the different ways that you would attack a drop, how the different ways that you would cut the offense, how the different ways that you would attack a switch. Um, there's, there's tons and tons of layers to playbooks at this level. And what I'm talking about right there is just more conceptual, like really within the offense, what are the fundamentals? What are you teaching? You know, when do you cut? How do you cut? Um, those things are very, very important. You know, particular coverages, how do you attack a particular coverage? How do you attack a hedge? How do you attack a switch? How do you attack an under? Uh, and we'll build out four or five options for our players um, so that, you know, if something's not working, we can go to the next thing. And that's, you know, the offense within the offense. Those are the fundamentals that I think are probably more important than any play you run. But I just want to give coaches an understanding of how you can design a particular offense for yourselves, how you can partic particularly look at designing and developing your own playbook. And then really, you know, the application is the, the art of coaching. Adam, any more questions? That is all we got. And we're right pretty much on time here. So we're doing really well. Okay, perfect. Um, again, thank you guys. And I will, uh, you know, uh, RoyBobbyRana at gmail.com. My personal email is probably the best one. Anybody wants to get in touch with me and has questions or, you know, um, yeah, want, want some, you know, whatever. I'm here. I'm here to help in any way I can. Obviously, love the game and 
love what coaches in Canada are doing. I, I will say that, you know, we have some of the best coaches in the world. Uh, I truly believe that. And uh, hopefully we can you know, keep promoting each other and keep building off of it because there's tons of coaching talent in, in Canada.